Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Brookhouse, and welcome to the Class Play podcast on the Sumer Sports Show. As we did last week, the Class Play is going to focus on the top quarterbacks in this year's draft. And this week, our spotlight is on the quarterback currently rated at three by grinding the mocks, Drake May. This podcast will again be a companion piece to our written series, Tour of the Top Four, which you can find on sumersports.com. And our article regarding Drake May will be coming out later this week, so make sure to keep an eye out for it. Joining me again, we have Tej Seth. Tej, tell us what's new, man. (laughs) I'm I'm just excited to be back here with the trio again. You know, Ben coming back and joining us is like a star player coming back from injury for the playoff push. Ben, he set you up well. How are you doing, man? I mean, I think he set me up a little too well, but no, I've been, I've just been vibing. Like I said, I'm, it's good to be back. I've just been checking out the Sumer, uh, the Sumer Sports NFL Draft Guide right now. I've been watching old Jake Locker highlights, so uh, it's been great. I would say, to be honest with you. Speaking of the Sumer Sports Draft Guide, you can find that on SumerSports.com right now. A lot of hard work went into that, especially by Tej, who we have here. Tej, what? Tell us more about the draft guide. Yeah, I mean, the, the draft guide was really fun to put together. I hope that everyone enjoys looking it over. Basically, what we did was we partnered with our friends at StatsBomb. They gave us some advanced statistics on 2023 for all of the top draft prospects. So we did quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, and tight ends. We have a bunch of um, you know pretty pretty good data in there from what they did their last college season. And then we also have 2024 projections. So what we think they're going to perform at from a fantasy standpoint. So you know if you're a dynasty manager, if you're a, a general fantasy football player. Player, or even just like a, a fan looking to learn more about those positions in particular. Like I think the draft guide will be really fun for you to look at. Awesome. And I can say it was a big part in me preparing for this podcast and it should be a big part for the audience to prepare for the draft. A lot of great data in there, a lot of advanced analytics, fantasy tools, just pure knowledge tools. I, I encourage everyone to check it out. And as always, if you're on live with us on this podcast, be sure to comment, subscribe, share and uh follow along so before we start ben you're rejoining us last week we went over our quarterbacks who are under the radar who are some of the quarterbacks that are under the radar for you yeah i mean i don't know if spencer rattler is anymore under the radar i think he's very much gone mainstream uh i know you guys had some discussion on you know this topic basically last week but to me i don't know it's it's i think you if you're looking obviously at the towards the end of this draft class like i think the one guy who and take this with a grain of salt because I was somewhat intrigued by the Jaron Hall selection of the Minnesota Vikings last year. But I think Keaton Slovis is actually kind of at least a guy who maybe fits this idea of what we're going to discuss with Drake May later on. It's like an early breakout year as a freshman. Obviously, a lot of that was, you know, the situation that he found himself with in at USC. But I, I think even given his like really weird career arc, I, I, and he doesn't necessarily have like a ton of arm strength. I think given the right offense, the right sort of situation, he's a guy that could at least be a somewhat productive fill-in type quarterback at the NFL level. And I'm not sure what exactly, you know, teams are really gravitating towards in their selections of guys. But I, I think if you're looking for more of like a back-end type starter, Keaton Slovis is the option. If you're looking for a, a guy who could turn into a legitimate you know, franchise type quarterback, then I think the only option is really Joel Milton at this point in time. So those are probably like the two uh, that, that, that I think probably weren't like some sort of discussion just based on what you're looking at at the quarterback and who you already have in your room, I would say. Yeah, with Slovis, it'll be interesting again to follow along given that he's another one of these transfer quarterbacks, you know, who have been in multiple different systems. And maybe if he finds a bit of consistency, catches on with the team as a backup or or someone who can show show up in camp, it'll be interesting to see how he progresses. So with our first segment, we're going to do the same rundown that we did last week and keep it, keep it the same, but this time for Drake May. We're going to start off with the first word. So Tej, if you could sum up what you've seen from Drake May in one word, what would that word be? My word for Drake May is potential. I think when you look at him, 6'4", 223 pounds, both are above average, uh, you know, compared to to all other quarterbacks that have had their height and weight marked since 2005. And that matters for quarterbacks, right? Like weight and height is something that is predictive of future NFL performance. So he checks the boxes there. 
He had a decent pressure to sack rate. He can scramble. And I think this is something that's being lost in the entire discussion about Drake May right now is he was only 21 years old last year. So when you evaluate him compared to some of the older quarterbacks in this draft, Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, like I would expect those quarterbacks to have looked better than, than, Jay, uh, than Drake May did last year because they had more experience than him. So I really see that untapped potential in him where he already showed a lot of flashes in college and then you can develop him for the next couple of years and, and really get him in a good spot. Yeah. You make a great point there about him being so young and showing a lot of flashes. Ben, what was your word? Yeah, I, I did really like Tasia's word. I, I think for me, the, the one that kind of jumps out is I would say kind of a, an explosive mentality. I would say both in the way in which he, in some ways, you know, really high uh, average depth of target, average depth of air yard sort of situation is not, you know, not afraid to kind of make the ball, uh, you know, I would say throw the football deep, challenge, you know, defensemen. And I would say in some ways, like, the, there are concerns with the way in which he gets through, especially his first read and those sort of progression type things. But I think both as like a runner and a passer, he has an element of explosiveness that is like few if unmatched. And I think that is kind of what makes him some of what taste shed with his potential, like an NFL ready prospect and one that I think a lot of people would gravitate towards in prior season. He kind of fits the bill of like what, what, what a quarterback built in the lab would look like from an NFL perspective for sure. For sure. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that in terms of being built in a lab uh, and, and, and being kind of a, just a, a, a guy that NFL scouts would want to see, you know, play play in, at the next level. And kind of your archetype would be a bigger guy that has a little weight on him and, and can throw and run a little bit at this point. I, I think that's kind of the ideal. And that's why the word I went with is a traditional. You know, he's a traditional prospect. He's a guy that went to one college, sat behind the NFL quarterback his freshman year, started two years, was pretty productive. Um, and, and he's a big guy. You know, he's 6'4", 6'5", uh, in the 220s, obviously a little bit more room to fill out. But he, he has that quarterback body. He has a big arm. Uh, he's a weapon on the ground. He can make some highlight throws. But then when you look at kind of the progressive nature of where we're going in football, you look at the advanced analytics, you look at some of the intangibles that we can now quantify a little bit better and we're working to quantify even more. Um, he, he's not as great. I mean, Tej mentioned some of, some of the stats that he's not ideal on. Uh, and I think we'll get into that more here as we start talking pros and cons, but you just look at the guy and, and he's kind of a traditional guy. I think in the, in the nineties or early two thousands, he probably would have been a lock for the number one pick just given his size. But now that we kind of have a little bit more information, particularly due to all of our hard work at Sumer and, and some of the hard work that's been done in other places, there's a little bit more question on him. And, and I think that's pretty interesting. So as we move into kind of why those questions come about, there's no two better people to ask about like the analytical pros and cons of these players. Tej, give us the breakdown of kind of his pros and cons that you see. Yeah, so I think, you know, one of his main pros is the sack avoidance that we talked about earlier. 18% pressure to sack rate, which was the third best out of the top eight quarterbacks in this class. I also think, you know, he was someone that was really aggressive. I know that North Carolina had an interesting situation last year with with their pass catching group where Tez Walker had to sit out, uh, you know, the beginning of the season because of NCAA ruling. And then eventually he was able to come back, but didn't end up being as productive as they probably hoped. So, you know, it's still encouraging to see Drake may have a, a pretty high adjusted air yards um, in regards to, 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 other quarterbacks in this draft class. And I think that also filters into some confidence that he has. Like he's someone who can, can scramble a decent amount. He has, uh, you know, he's someone who had a, a pretty high scramble rate, a pretty good EPA per rush when doing so. So like that, that ability to, to know that you can push the ball downfield, you can take off when needed, I think will help him when he gets to the next level. But there are some cons. His, his accuracy was something that was definitely lacking in 2023, he had only a 0.5% completion percentage over expected, which is the lowest of the eight quarterbacks in this class. I'm also a little bit worried about elevating his surroundings. Like I think, you know, he was someone that maybe didn't do a good job of helping his offensive line play at a level above what their talent level was. You could say the same for receivers. And, uh, you know, Bill Connolly had a, a really interesting point when he was writing an article about Drake May, where he pointed out that among the 126 
QBR eligible quarterbacks in 2023. Drake may had the 10th best QBR against zone, but the 105th against man. So it's, it's going to be really interesting to, to see how that progresses to the NFL. Maybe you chalk up his man performance to his receivers, not being able to beat man coverage, or, or maybe that's something that is an inherently uh, difficult to him. So I'm, I'm curious to follow that when he plays in the NFL. Yeah, you you listed out a great list there. And and obviously, I think a lot of those we look at kind of that UNC team, obviously, it wasn't as much of a powerhouse as some of these other JJ McCarthy was on even uh, even um, like an L- extremely talented LSU team with some of the wide receivers that Jane Daniels played. Ben, obviously, you have a team that is potentially might trade up for Drake May. What are your kind of pros and cons? uh looking at that yeah definitely uh and and i think you know obviously in this discussion of like all the top four quarterbacks there is this element that i think you know we're we're still in a lot of ways investigating and trying to unpack but it is also you know pretty pretty paramount to the overall success for how these guys develop is the situation that they find themselves in i you know being a minnesota vikings fan think that in a lot of ways they they probably set up as well as any other team to provide the structure and, and capabilities and framework for a, a rookie quarterback to be really successful. And I think in a lot of ways, Drake may could be that guy because he does have, I would say a, a ceiling that is potentially unmatched within this draft class. Kind of like Tage said in a lot of ways, like he has a willingness and arm talent to throw the ball deep to make a ton of these NFL type throws. There are questions about, you know, his ability to actually get off his first read in some of those situations. But to me, I think in spots even where he, he probably should have gotten off his first read quicker or maybe didn't make the correct read getting over to, you know, across the field. Like later on, even in some of those games, we did see him actually succeed in some of that. So I think there's like an element of growth based on his age that we are kind of tearing apart, you know, just a couple seasons where he was, you know, a, 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 a freshman and then a true sophomore and true junior playing. And, and I think if we go back to just how young he actually is, like you would expect some of those you know, initial reads and maybe the game to at some points in some plays, maybe be playing a little bit faster than what he projected. But I think overall his ability to learn from that and, and kind of alleviate those situations in future plays is going to speak to him actually being a really successful NFL player. So I think that's got to be his pros, kind of like, you know, Taze mentioned, like, can he beat zone? That's a, that's a, that's a pretty, you know, uh, a crucial type situation. How well is he evaluating some of the defenses in which he's facing, especially when, you know, the defense at the NFL level are more likely to disguise, uh, you know, what coverage their types of they're playing. So if he does have some of those issues, you know, reading defenses, especially before the snap, uh, because it was such a, you know, RPO type heavy uh, offense that the North Carolina Tar Heels ran. Like those are the types of questions that I think can be answered. But I think given the right structure, the right coach, the right offensive coordinator, I, I think he will definitely find some of that success. Uh, and I think he can, can find, find it relatively quickly and doesn't really need to, you know, go the route of like Jordan Love and, and sit a year or two or anything like that. I do think he is a guy that could be very successful starting off right away and actually being, you know, that franchise type, that guy from day one. Yeah, I think y'all both did a fantastic job of talking about how much potential this player has and that he's he's young, so he may reach his potential. And I think one of those kind of growth standpoints that you can see is, you know, his first year as a starter, he was at the bottom of, you know, ESPN's tracking of EPA loss due to sacks. Like sacks really hurt him his first year as a starter. We go into his platform year, we go into last year, and as, as Tej said, he, he actually stacks up pretty well against some of the other quarterbacks in this draft class in terms of pressure to sack ratio. And so understanding that growth is definitely a good sign and for, for the future and, and kind of summarizes his, his pros when we're looking at the ability to take that big time throw ability, package it with potentially better accuracy in the NFL as he progresses. You just look at the cons, and interestingly, it seems kind of like a flip of what J.J. McCarthy was we talked about last week, where J.J. McCarthy, we're pretty sure about the intangibles. Obviously, some of the reads and progressions we need to see at the NFL level uh, because Michigan obviously was running the ball a lot, a little bit more of a power offense. But, you know, you say this guy's a winner, this guy is a leader, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really necessarily know that about Drake May, and really, what is driving his value is his, you know, physical nature, his ability to fit in, um, 
fit and throws into tight windows and kind of the more traditional stuff rather than the intangibles and the analytics. And so I think a lot of that will come together as we kind of move forward. And obviously we've all done the research here. Tej, what would you say the most intriguing game that May played uh, is for you? Yeah, I, I do think it was the game he played against Duke, um, you know, pretty late in the season where you have this double overtime game and he passed 41 times in that game. He rushed another nine times. All 50 of those plays combined added a total of 22 EPA. So like we talked about with JJ McCarthy last week where it's like, yeah, like it's we shouldn't knock him for having such low usage rate, but like it does add more uncertainty into like how he's going to handle a, a high usage rate if he has to do that in an NFL game. Like we saw that from Drake May multiple times, and I think this Duke game was a, a good example of that, where he got the ball down three with 41 seconds to go, was able to lead a, a game tying drive, you know, ended up winning in overtime because Duke ended up missing a, a two point conversion. So you saw a very high volume, high efficiency game from him. And I think that even though there were times in the game where his accuracy was spotty, that's more of an embodiment of, you know, what he's like as a, as an overall prospect, the, the highs were really high in that game. And I think that that is something that you can carry towards you as you go into the, the next level. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Ben, what was an interesting game that you saw? Yeah, definitely. I, I don't think this was his most intriguing game by any stretch of the imagination. And I know people are going to say, I, I want to talk about Minnesota and either the Vikings or the Gophers at any point in time. But I do think his Gophers game week three this past season was really uh, an intriguing uh, film study, both on like what side of what side of Drake made you actually fall on. I think that, that franchise guy uh, who was also from Minnesota did a great film breakdown on YouTube involving this game, kind of going through every single passing play that he had. In a lot of ways, I think you can take plays from this game on both sides, whether you are high on him or low on him and, and, and kind of piece things together. So I think overall from where he was at, like this was a really intriguing game for him as a prospect. He had two interceptions. I think he threw for over 400 yards on like 19 completions or something. So it was a ton of like big play type plays, but even the one in which I think he had a guy like wide open and he ended up being tackled at the one yard line. Like it wasn't a, a, a great great throw whatsoever in a lot of ways and the guy was just so wide open so i think evaluating where he was at had the two interceptions kind of like i said one was from a lack of maybe handling pressure um which do you kind of put on him i know he was you know behind a pretty bad offensive line at north carolina but i think in some ways he needs to be aware of that and then another interception he had was just like a really flat ball and, and the defender made a really good play but there were definitely some flashes and i think early on you know especially with what the franchise guy focused on with this game like there were reads early on that he missed and, and, the, and north carolina kind of went back to some of those plays later on he actually hit probably the correct second or third read uh, on a deep post play uh which was kind of like the perfect throw and he did have a number of other plays that i would say kind of speak to his ability to make these nfl level throws and i think overall against uh, what I consider a pretty good secondary from the Gophers, like they kind of ran away with this one. And although, you know, it was only on 19 completions, uh, it, it was this like big play explosive type potential uh, that, that Drake may kind of flash. And I think overall that was the one that, you know, made me uh, a, a pretty big believer in what he could do. Obviously some misses, but again, I think from an age standpoint, like those things are very much correctable. And we did see him kind of uh, handle that even, you know, throughout the course of that particular game as well. Yeah, and I think coupling Tasia's points about the usage rate and with your points, Ben, about kind of the flashes that we always see. Retired Donator here commenting with us said he's good at looking good, and that kind of summarizes what I've kind of seen is, is you know, like the big plays look fantastic. They look NFL ready, and, and that's why I picked this kind of interesting back-and-forth shootout Georgia Tech game where, honestly, they ran – uh, the Tar Heels ran a little bit more than you'd expect in a game that's so high scoring. He only had 25 passing attempts, which obviously is a good number. But when, when you see a guy that's put up 40, 45 attempts before in his career, especially in a, a Mac Brown offense, um, you, you'd expect that in a game with 40 plus points for about for both teams would have more throws. But, you know, you, you kind of get to see all of him in a game where, He's hitting throws and all, all of his touchdowns were, were pretty fantastic. And his, his rushing touchdown in particular was pretty good where he kind of scrambles the pocket sneakily is dangerous on, on the, on the run and scores a touchdown. 
Um, but there's a lot of misses, man. You know, I, I think he probably missed another touchdown where it looks like it goes in between the guy's hands, but he, he's, he's not necessarily throwing to his number one or two receiver. You got to know that, but it's a wide open guy you have to hit, especially in, in a game like that where it's going back and forth. He, there, there were some under throws. There were some open guys, some, some strange reads that I didn't really know against, you know, three seam or, or checking man and not knowing it's man running. And there was just kind of, it, it wasn't the cleanest thing. And I think you watch the whole game and you expect to see kind of Josh Allen 2.0, especially against a Georgia te- tech team that struggled from time to time this year. And, and he seemed like a college player. And I think that kind of fits into the, to the greater narrative that we have about his age where obviously he does have that ceiling, but when you're comparing him to some of the more polished guys, obviously like Penix and Knicks are, are very polished, had been in, in college for a while, really had the time to develop. Um, you see stuff like that in it, and it gets a little dicey when you're projecting out to the professional level. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a very valid point about kind of like that that up and down and some of the misses he had. And our friend Kevin Cole, uh, you know, had a, a very interesting thread on this topic last draft season where he pointed out that, you know, you think about 10, 15 years ago when Tom Brady and, and Peyton Manning were dominating the league and everyone was chasing the next Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, right? But like you couldn't necessarily replicate their high level processing, you know, their ability to, to not take sacks despite not being that mobile, like different stuff like that you, you weren't able to replicate. And he pointed out like, are we kind of making the the same mistake going through it again, where we're chasing these, these traits quarterbacks now because of the success of Mahomes and, and Herbert, where everyone wants, you know, their own version of that. You see Anthony Richardson go really high despite his accuracy, not being great, but, but his, his traits and his, you know, sack points being at a high level, like, how do you kind of, and you know, I'm not sure I necessarily agree or disagree with this take. Like, I think it's an interesting point to, to bring up. So Ben, like when you look at Drake may and you see that his accuracy is, is below average, but he has the high level traits, um, you know, the, the prototypical build, like how do you kind of balance that when you're looking at, at him from a holistic uh, perspective? Yeah, I think it is a really good question. And I don't think I necessarily like kind of like you don't strongly disagree with Kevin, but I think overall, you know, traits and intangibles and those sorts of things are always going to be evaluated at the NFL level. And they always have been right. And in some ways we maybe have slightly changed the, the set of measurables and things that we're looking for in a quarterback, but it does seem like from a league evolution standpoint, especially with how offenses want to attack defenses, like there are more desirable traits given the overall structure for the league and the, in the direction in which I would say defenses have kind of gone. And to me, I think, you know, like especially, you know, edge and outside backers and those sorts of things like guys have continuously gotten more athletic. To me, the way in which you can kind of navigate that is having a more athletic quarterback that at least offers some sort of rushing threat along with it. And then you do introduce the RPO game. And I think overall, I think that the the traits and things that we're sort of looking for have changed somewhat because offenses have switched to the point where we are seeing a ton of RPOs and those sorts of things and the quarterbacks that are most threatening in those sorts of environments need to have some semblance of rushing production in order to kind of justify those reads. So I I think overall, I I think to me, it's more just like an idea that the NFL is kind of a copycat league and whatever is kind of like the most successful is very much like what people gravitate towards and try to replicate. And I just don't know if that, overarching philosophy is going to lead to success for like the teams, you know, team C through K or something like that, right? Like the mid tier guys, I I think you need to kind of forge your own path and try other things. If you actually want to be the top dog, if you don't have a guy like Patrick Mahomes or Peyton Manning or or Tom Brady, I would say. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great approach. And what I'll add to it is that, you know, there's kind of these quote meat market stats about, you know, your height or weight or, or, or things like that. And obviously we've seen that kind of go away to a point in baseball where, you know, the, the quote meat market stats don't necessarily make a difference. I think that in football, it's interesting because they, they do kind of matter to a point in that, you know, there is a, an archetype that we have seen s- succeed at the quarterback position and the defensive position. I think the quarterback position in particular is a little bit more difficult because 
no one's really been extremely adept over time at identifying what, you know, makes a quarterback tick. Um, but I think particularly when you have guys of a certain size, defensive ends, defensive tackles and linebackers bearing down on you, there is kind of a, a barrier to entry or a threshold that at the minimum you want to reach in, le- in, in lieu of any great advanced analytics or in lieu of some other great trait that can be identified because sim- it's just easier to coach, you know? Yeah, I think it when provides have- a higher floor than a ce- like the ceiling outcome, right? Like I think it gives your offense more production at the base level, which is yeah. intriguing to coaches who want to, you know, delay the inevitable of potentially getting fired or something. Else. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's just like how long do you have to figure out the accuracy um, you know, when, when you look at two quarterbacks, or I mean, the three buckets of quarterbacks, right? Like you have your prototypical pocket passers, you have your quarterbacks who can run. Like I think about like Justin Herbert as someone who's in that bucket. And then you have your your pure mobile quarterbacks, um, you know, the, the Lamar Jacksons uh, as, as like at Josh Allen's. And I think about Josh Allen in particular, where it's like, yeah, he came out, did not have great accuracy, but he was a quarterback who was was very mobile in his first two years in the league. And that gave him just like a longer time to figure out the accuracy. Like the Bills could still have a competent offense, an offense that, you know, ended up making the playoffs with Josh Allen before he really took the big jump because he was just someone who could run it, you know, gave them some uh, an extra threat in the red zone. And then his third year, um, you know, topical because Stephon Diggs got traded today, but Stephon Diggs gets traded to the Bills. And like you really see Josh Allen take that that pass game jump. So it's like when you look at these these quarterbacks who are at least somewhat mobile, uh, if they don't have the accuracy their rookie year, or even their second year, like that just gives them a, a longer leash to figure that stuff out. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. And I think it's interesting that you talk about those three buckets of quarterbacks, because as we move forward into kind of our player comparables for this player, I'd be interested to know about, you know, where does he project in that next in that next few years? Does he stick in that kind of mobile range that a Josh Allen uh, did the first two years and then grow into something else. Tej, what are your thoughts and what are some of your comps? Yeah. So comps wise, we have this on the draft guide um, where basically what I did was I took all of their basic college stats. So, you know, you think about yards per attempt, you think about rush rate, uh, you know, rushing touchdowns, like all that stuff took their combine measurables. So height, weight, if they did any of the the actual events and threw it all into a K nearest neighbors algorithm. And it determined the three closest comps to them based on, you know, this, this very uh, multidimensional analysis that was going on. So the ones that it spit out and like, again, these aren't strong comps, like they're, they're very low percentages, but Jake Locker, 23%, Justin Fields, 12% and Joe Burrow, 11%. So I'm going to let Ben talk about Jake Locker. Cause I was too young to really know much about him, but I did think that they were, they were pretty interesting comps for, for Drake May. Yeah, I would say as someone who, and I, I should probably, you know, turn in my evaluation card in this, but the Jake Locker year was the same year that the Vikings took Christian Ponder. And I was actually like fully on board with the Vikings taking Jake Locker. And, and I think in a lot of ways, like this comp for Jake Locker with Drake Bay does kind of make a lot of sense to me. I think, you know, where he was at from a college standpoint, like he did have the big arm. He could rush the football, you know, number eight overall pick, basically. Like, he was a guy who probably didn't land in the right situation. But I think if you have Jake Locker land in the right situation, there are simulations where he ends up being a relatively productive NFL quarterback. So I actually don't mind that comp. I didn't think it was also interesting, like, splitting the difference between Justin Fields and Joe Burrow was, like, uh, interesting to me that it was those two guys that kind of popped up from another um, uh, uh, another comp according to our, you know, your math. But to me, when I, when I watch Drake, it is like some semblance and I know it's, you know, going to be a somewhat popular take and, uh, and Sam already mentioned it, but I do see some Josh Allen, maybe not quite as dynamic from a rushing standpoint, but I think with his sack avoidance and the way in which he could at least get ahead of the pass rush, I, I think that was kind of like where I'm really intrigued with his rushing upside. And I think that's kind of the piece uh, that I really see with him and Josh Allen outside of just, you know, the the, the arm talent and, and the willingness to kind of make every throw. So I think in some ways, you know, the, the trajectory, obviously a little bit poorer accuracy, high A dot kind of what we said, uh, average depth of target over expectation, as well as what you can find in the Sumer 
uh, you know, draft, uh, the draft guide as well. You can kind of see he ranks really highly in that. That's something that Tej, uh put out. So I, I do see some Josh Allen. I think there's an upside case there. And I think the downside risk, you know, with Josh Allen is very much a Jake Locker type. So I do think those definitely fit with where I see Drake May and, and his potential range of outcomes for sure. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the Josh Allen thing because when I came in and decided to put a closer eye on Drake May, I was kind of expecting given, you know, looking at his numbers, looking at his height and weight, kind of the the narrative that he's the best physical quarterback in the draft right now. I was expecting to kind of lean more to that Josh Allen comp and say like, you know, his ceiling would be Josh Allen. And I it was it was kind of tough to gauge. I didn't I didn't love it as much as I wanted to when I really started digging into the film. I think a lot of people have said that he's kind of like a smaller Herbert. I, I think that makes sense in terms of like the the college career arc, uh, he, you know, playing and starting and, and being highly rated for two years. And then obviously as we move towards the draft, kind of slipping, at least right now, he's slipped from, you know, a, a guy who was basically locked to go two to now he's more likely to go three. And there's questions about whether someone may trade up and select JJ McCarthy and what does that do to the quarterback market? So I can understand that. I, I think Herbert, is a, a little different. I, I think you mentioned the bucket about guys that can run. Uh, I think they both kind of fit there. When I was thinking about what he projects to in the pros, I think like a, a Ryan Tannehill kind of makes sense. A guy who the team probably leans a lot more on his mobility than probably makes a ton of sense, but is effective in an offense where that's run heavy and an, a structure that's really good. And I think that's kind of the best comp given his height, weight, athleticism in terms of a guy that's in the pros right now. And in terms of what, you know, on the average sense, we may be able to see from May going forward. I, I actually really like like the Carson Wentz, Ryan Dana Hill comps, because again, like you, the, the bucket that I just talked about a couple of minutes ago, it's like, yeah, you have your, your quarterbacks who will pass most of the time, but they can scramble when needed and they can be pretty effective at it. Like they're not just complete statues back there. And I think like he fits that type of quarterback where like, even you think about like once, especially when he was, he was still good, but it's like, yeah, like that's someone who, who had the size and the weight to actually like take a hit or two and, and maybe break a tackle when he was scrambling. And like, I think Drake may could do that. Um, you know, I know he did that at, at UNC from time to time. So like maybe he can translate that over to the NFL. Yeah. So we talk about that fit and, and Ben, this is your time, man, as, as Vikings expert, number one, the number one Vikings expert on the internet, Ben Brown, obviously the Vikings have those two picks. They're looking perhaps to trade up may, may be the target. Well, what are your thoughts on how he fits with your Vikes? Yeah, I think first of all, Matt Collar is going to have some issues with any of those claims that you just said. He probably would have me rank like 14th on the on the Vikings Twitter list or something, which <laughs> might be a little bit more accurate. But no, I think you know, and it is obviously like the Vikings for me as far as like best fit. But I think overall, from like what Kevin O'Connell can provide to him, they obviously can very much like build an offense that's going to be productive around him. Having Justin Jefferson, having TJ Hawkinson, you know, having Jordan Addison, like they obviously went out and got Aaron Jones as well. Like they have a legitimate offense, I think, very much. Like it's kind of rounded into form, and he could kind of be, you know, that one missing piece. Obviously, in some ways, he probably doesn't need to be as accurate uh, in, in the Vikings context as what he would need to be in like a situation with the New England Patriots or the New York Giants. I think overall, like this is going to be a much more robust downfield pass and attack if he does end up in Minnesota. And I'm not saying like he's going to end up in like a Jameis Winston type situation, but I do think defensively, like the Vikings have a ton of holes and a ton of issues that they need to get right. And, and they are going to play some explosive games and you could kind of see, you know, Drake may in a similar fashion, to what we saw with Jameis Winston, you know, in Tampa Bay with the receivers that he had leading the league and passing yards for like a 10 and seven type team. Like I think that's kind of, the, the direction I see in which he could be most productive for these first two seasons, I very much think that it has to be, you know, from a Minnesota Vikings standpoint, they have to be very much, much like the ideal landing spot for him, for sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you, you we mentioned the Vikings. I think there was an interesting thing that me and Tej were talking about um, earlier this week about how, 
you know, he technically would be the best fit for any quarterback. And there's a chance that if the Vikings do end up trading up for a quarterback or sticking and taking a quarterback a little later, he may end up being the best quarter, the best quarterback selection just based off of the infrastructure. So mm-hmm. Tej, what are, what do you think the kind of fit is there and, and who else do you think he may work on? Yeah. I mean, that's a great point by you, by uh, about the infrastructure, by the way, like you think about nature versus nurture. And if you believe in, in nurture, when it comes to, um, you know, how well you can support a, a rookie quarterback, like I think that the Vikings are, are definitely one of the top teams to do that. Like Ben mentioned, um, you know, I, I think I'm going to throw out like the, the other obvious one here, but like the commanders, I think would work with him, right? Like you think about when, when you look at what they have already at, at wide receiver, um, between Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson, um, and, and, you know, what they can provide from like someone who wants to push the ball downfield and, and true like ball winners that can work in the intermediate and deep range. Like, I think that would work out really well for him. Um, you know, Cliff Kingsbury is someone who is is more of like a, a wait and see offensive coordinator just because like we don't know what he's going to look like just purely running an offense at the NFL level. We, we know what it looked like when he was a head coach. And, you know, I thought that his first year, year or two in, in Arizona, like their run game uh, with Kyler Murray was like legit. So like maybe he still has some of that design run aspect to, to having a quarterback that can run in that. But I, I think Washington would be an interesting choice as well. Tennessee was was one that crossed my mind, but I don't think that it would necessarily work out because when you look at the Bengals last year, they had the lowest average at the target in the entire league. And, you know, he's, I think Drake May is someone that's going to want to push the ball downfield. So with Brian Callahan coming over to be the play caller, like maybe they, they do roll with Levis who actually, you know, funny enough had the highest a dot in the league last year. So it'll be interesting to see how those styles kind of clash, but that could be a, a potential option for the, uh, the, 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 you know, the Titans as well. If, if somehow Drake may gets past like the third pick or something. Yeah. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you bring up the Titans, that's really the only thing I have to add uh, to all of our Minnesota love. I I think a team, should he really drop? I think a a team that already has a quarterback, I think you're in a great land to show, you know, kind of a Jordan love. Maybe he sits for a year behind a Matthew Stafford or something like that. Like who knows? Um, Ben, we're, we're getting calls for more Minnesota propaganda. I'd love for you to answer this question from Sean Donahue. Would you be willing to move Jordan Addison to move in the top three? Do you think that it will take a move, in, of some, including something like Jordan Addison? What do you think it will take to jump up and get a Drake May type player? Yeah, and I, and I would say yeah, even just Sean's last comment as well. I feel like I, I've worked the I've worked the inside wire with the Vikings. I, we were on the Kirk Cousins to Atlanta trade early, so I've worked everything I possibly can. Uh, here, I, I think to me, and going back to it, like I do think the Vikings very much are kind of enamored with Drake May. And I think they do want to do what they can to move up. The question is, is like, what do they actually have to give up to the New England Patriots in order to have that selection if the commanders, you know, don't take them at number two overall? And to me, you know, I I would love if they would take, you know, the two first this year in Jordan Addison. I don't think that would probably be the and, and maybe it's my read on you know, the, the, the wide receiver market in general, I was a little bit surprised. I would say that, the, you know, the, the bills even got, you know, a second round pick for, um, you know, stuff on digs today, obviously Jordan Addison and his rookie contract situation are different, but I think if you can give up two first and Jordan Addison, I would definitely do that to me. I think it's going to take, you know, the multiple first this year and the first next year. And I think that's going to be the sticking point to whether, you know, Questy wants to do that or not basically to get up to number three or if he would need, you know, assurances that his guy is going to be at that selection before making that type of move. Well, I, I think the interesting question is like, you talk about pairing the two firsts this year and Jordan Addison versus, you know, instead of instead of Jordan Addison, you're, you're trading the, the future first next year. Like if you're the Patriots or Cardinals, which one would you rather have? And then if you're the Vikings, which one would you rather give up? Right. Yeah, it is a good question. I think, and like so much of the expectation would be like where the Vikings obviously land with that future first round pick. But to me, I would still be more confident in giving up Jordan Addison just based on some my, my, the way in which I would say his rookie year unfolded. I do think you have a lot more information on where he's at. And he definitely did have some flashes, but I think overall, 
you know, there was situations, especially with Justin Jefferson's injury, where he probably didn't pop or do things that he would maybe have needed to do to really legitimately the answer, like, is he going to be like a top worth, like a top 15 pick or something in future seasons? And to me, uh, I think the question is still out on that. So I'd probably lead in Jordan Addison's direction from Minnesota, but I am with you. I do think in a lot of ways, you know, the, the, both the Patriots, Commanders, and Cardinals would probably all lean in the future first uh, direction, I would say, as well. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. You're looking at two, three, and four, obvi- and, and including the Vikings as well. The Commanders, obviously, new ownership, uh, sharing ownership with the 76ers. The 76ers in, in the history, obviously, now they have Daryl Morey, have been a... a if not perhaps one of the most in across sports investors in in analytics, I would expect something similar to come uh, from the commanders. Obviously they may be glancing at some of the literature and saying trading back, we could get immense value. Uh, You look at pick three, the Patriots craft analytics group, you know, they have holdings in analytics too. Do they think trading back may be worth it? And then obviously pick four, we all saw the, the, the photo, uh, excuse me, the video of their general manager come out yesterday where he's working the phones, he's checking if it's an even deal. They're using points and trying to really figure out how to trade back last year. Maybe this is another situation where, you know, a, a JJ McCarthy comes up before Drake May and he's on the phone with the Vikings who are ran by uh, an extremely analytical mind. And they're having these kind of pick value battles and trying to align the pick value to make it right. So Ben, I think that's great insight. And I think that this is definitely something that, you know, at two, three, four, and whoever would be trading up would be a discussion that would be had. And so moving on to our final segment about Drake May, let's say we're it's four years from now, Drake May has played out his rookie contract. Maybe he he's going to play a fifth year option. Maybe not. What do you think, we are talking about at that time. Tej, we'd love to hear what your thoughts. <laughs> so I think he's going to be someone where people who who really grind the film or, you know, people who, who do a lot of film-based grades will be higher on than his his EPA, his, his production numbers, because I think when you look at like some of the things he, he did in college um, from what people are saying about him as a draft prospect compared to like what his EPA per play actually was, like that told a pretty similar story. Um, you know, we're going to see what situation he ends up getting drafted into, right? Like, obviously, we talked about the Vikings. Like, I don't know if this will necessarily hold true for the Vikings, but maybe some of the other teams in that top five, top ten range will – it'll take Drake May a little time to to get the infrastructure around him to really uh, to, to have a, a top ten production. But he could still continue to put out top ten film and, and you know, be in that, that kind of like Trevor Lawrence, Justin Herbert area where, like, the – when you watch him, it looks good and it always doesn't show up in the stats. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Ben, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I do. Lo- I do love that. I would say from what Tate's provided with, you know, the Trevor Lawrence, Justin Herbert, to me, I think he'll probably be like a tier below that where we are still really trying to evaluate, especially if he ends up in Minnesota, like how much of his performance is reflective of the structure and environment that he had around him and then very much trying to decide or decipher if they if they should be you know uh you know extending him or giving him that high you know lucrative second second contract basically and i think that's going to be kind of where he's at after four years hopefully they've hoisted you know one if not two nfc north division champions hang the banner uh over the over the detroit lions and we'll see how that actually plays out but i think overall like we might be having you know similar conversation with drake may as far as like he does provide some things, especially from, you know, an explosive play type break, but kind of like what Tage said, like the EPA per play, how consistent he is. Is he as good as we're projecting from a sack avoidance standpoint? If he is, then I very much think he'll probably be, you know, that that could be like that fringe 10 to 11, 12 quarterback type production, I would say. Yeah, and I agree with both of your standpoints. And Sean has an interesting point in the comments here about in four years, the Wilfs will have a new wing built at the practice facility for all the Lombardies. I think this represents an interesting edge case that I, I think out of all the players in the draft, uh, May is probably the most likely to fit in, obviously. Um, but it is it would be that he goes to the Vikings or he goes to a good team and then wins immediately. 
but maybe doesn't have that statistical background, maybe isn't providing a ton of value long term. And he just becomes kind of a player like Carson Wentz, where he does provide value, but he ends up getting moved off of because maybe they extended him and he's too expensive. Maybe they don't want to give him the fifth year option, even though the wins were there and maybe he led a team to a Super Bowl or something like that. Um, I think this is a great question for Tej to answer on a serious note. Do you think his mobility and sack avoidance are being under discussed? Yeah, I mean, I do think so. I think that, you know, you guys did a great job of talking about that throughout this episode. But like, again, going back to our draft guide, out of the eight, the top eight quarterbacks in this class, third best pressure to sack rate, um, you know, 10% scramble rate, which was the, the fourth highest. Um, and then he had a, a 0.64 EPA per rush. So, you know, he's someone who could be used on design rushes as well. So like, I think because of, you know, probably his, his build or, um, you know, the, the stuff, when you look at him, like you don't think about him as like someone who's going to be really good at avoiding sacks, scrambling, uh, being used on design rushes, but like he's, he's probably being underrated in that regard. Like Sean mentioned in the chat. Yeah, I, I think that's a good view. So that'll conclude our kind of breakdown of Drake May. But before we go, we've been building the team. We have a, a, a lot of players on our team now. Ben is Ben is a little empty handed. He has a couple he has a couple that uh, that he's missed. But we'll start off with safeties this week. Obviously, on my team, I have Reggie Bush, Al Woods, Barkevius Mingo, Des Bryant, Michael Crabtree, Malcolm Jenkins, who is kind of a cheat pick for a cornerback because he came in as a cornerback. I'm actually going to do the same thing with safety where I'm picking Tyron Matthew. Uh, this is a guy who, you know, I, I, we talked a lot about last year about how things have kind of changed um, just more, more in society and how, how football can be kind of a harbinger of that. Tyron Matthew wins the Heisman, a fiery player, an undersized player, almost wins the Heisman, a Heisman finalist with a great year. Then the next year is expected to be a Heisman finalist again at kind of a nickel safety, which at the time wasn't extremely used across college. And and then obviously gets gets arrested for, uh, I think it was marijuana charges, ends up getting suspended for a whole year, according to NCAA rules, drops extremely to, to I think, the third or fourth round. And, and then obviously comes in and has had a really long and really successful career across the Cardinals, the Texans, Chiefs. Uh, and the Saints where he is now. And he's been re really successful. I think he's just a good guy, kind of another guy who was drafted as kind of a tweener corner. People didn't know where he fit. And then as the league has evolved, it, it doesn't really matter where he fits. Obviously, he can kind of he can blitz, he can play safety, he can play a little nickel back to play in the box against the run. And that's why I think he's an interesting prospect to look back on now in 2024. Taze, what are your thoughts? That's a fantastic one. I mean, watching Tyron Matthew highlights that, you know, when he was at LSU, just such a cool nickname too, on top of that, like that was definitely, uh, you know, someone who had a lot of aura early on here, but for, for me, I'll, I'll go with Kyle Hamilton. So, um, you know, I think about like when I like, when I realized like, wow, this <laughs> Kyle Hamilton special, I remember, you know, when you're a, a draft D gen, like I think we all are, you look at big boards of the next year's draft, like, you know, even before, you know, sometimes the, the previous year's draft had been completed. And like, I remember he was someone that was talked about. I was like, all right, like he's going to be one of the best safety prospects of recent NFL history or NFL draft history. So I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. Like I'll, I'll check him out. Notre Dame played a, a Monday night game against Florida state week one of that season. And, you know, that game is remembered because of a Brian Kelly quote after the game. But what I really remembered from that game was his two interceptions um, you know, he had one where he crossed the entire field uh, to, to get the interception. Like you notice his speed, his his ball recognition, like everything that he's shown as possibly like one of the best safeties in the NFL right now, he showed in that game. And I, I just really thought that he was going to be something special at the next level. And I'm, you know, unlike some of the other people on my team, like, like Tavon Austin and, and Justin Blackman and DeAnthony Thomas, like Kyle Hamilton actually did it at the next level, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I was lucky enough. I was at Notre Dame uh, working, getting my master's that year. And he, he was an interesting prospect because of his size. And mm -hmm. but the, I guess despite his size, per se, he could really play every, you know, second or third level defensive position. And that has obviously translated really well to that dangerous Ravens defense. 
Ben, on shorthand, you're going with an absolute ringer here. Who are you picking? Yeah, I'm going with the OG. It has to be the best safety of all time. I would say Ed Reed, basically. I got to bring him in to solidify the back end of my defense. Like, no one else ever could, I would say. If you need any more Ed Reed propaganda, I'm sure you guys have probably seen it. But, like, when he – the, the discussion with Bill Belichick and Peyton Manning when he, like, baits Peyton Manning into mm-hmm. an interception basically is, like, the greatest greatest defensive football play ever. Like, nobody nobody has come along like Ed Reed, and I don't know if anybody ever will again. He was just simply, I would say, like, probably the best at his position and really didn't do it from, like, a physical standpoint. It was, like, so much mental. And I think, like, evaluating him and, and how productive he was would, would just be, like, such an analytical challenge because he is very much like, you know, kind of chasing magic in a bottle. Kind of our discussion earlier on, like you're just not going to find a production trying to pinpoint or find another Ed Reed like you could. So to me, he's the standard bearer and simply the best basically for sure. Yeah. We like Sean tuning in here with his class play pick, Bob Sanders, another legend. I, I, I think I'd have to pick Ed Reed over Bob Sanders. Ben, any thoughts on that? Maybe, I think so. I think so, too. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm partial to Ed Reed. I might be showing up next week with an Ed Reed jersey, so we'll see what Ooh. happens. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, guys, and thanks, everyone, for tagging in. Before we leave, I know we're all kind of working on some other things. Tej, what are you working on? What should people keep, keep an eye out for? <laughs> I mean, after the draft guide, I don't even know if I have anything left to do. I think that took up <laughs> So much energy for me, but no, I'm actually going to be working on uh, some graphics for the draft show that we're going to do. So all of us, I think, will be will be on it. Uh, you know, we'll be broadcasting live on April 25th. So so time to really start preparing for that. Awesome, and I know me and Ben have been working on this Drake May piece. Ben, any final words on Drake May? No, man. I would say check out the Sumer Sports uh, draft NFL draft guide. It's uh, second to none in our industry, just like Ed Reed. I would say so. Get on it. <laughs> Great. So Ben, Tej, I want to thank you for joining me. Everyone in the crowd, the audience on Twitter, YouTube, again, make sure to follow us and su- subscribe. Go check out our draft guide. All you need is an email for something that I would pay years ago and, and even still today. I would pay hundreds and thousands of dollars for great information like that. It didn't even exist 10 years ago, and now it's brought to you only for the price of an email. So make sure to check that out. And from Ben, Tej, and Sam, and Sumer Sports as a whole, thank you very much.